Welcome, Sam. Thanks for doing this. Sure. Yeah. It's great to be here. Thanks, Mason. And uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I uh, I will. There the um, the PDFs that Mason was talking about. There were so many questions. I went up to YouTube and just kind of copied and pasted about the first thirty there. I don't know if we get. I'm not. I'm not sure how long we're doing this. Uh, if it's about an hour or whatever. But um, I figured that was probably that combined with the questions that y'all might have uh, would probably fill that time. So. Um, Though one of the questions that came up over and over and over again was, uh, what would you take into the field with you and so forth? So the PDFs that Mason is talking about, I thought, why not just put those out? And if any of you are here who are students, you've probably seen this, but I have two PDFs that we um, put out a lot. And one of them is called, used to be called the top 25 herbs for the end of the world. It's not called that now, but it's basically the same concept. I don't remember what we changed the name to. And so that'll be available. And the other one is a um, first aid kit packing list that's both first aid and herbal first aid. And it gets into quite a bit of, of detail on the herbal first aid side. Um, and I'll talk more about that because that's what we do. I mean, if you go to our store, which is at herbalfirstaidgear.com, type that in here. You'll see that we have an entire section on herbal first aid kits that are for the field and so forth. And a lot of these formulas are formulas that I uh, just started developing and using because we were in the field a lot with our outreach organization, Herbal Medics, in Nicaragua, in Mexico, in um, Belize, in all over the U.S. and different underserved areas. So um, that was these were things that just came up time and time again. And I'll talk a little bit about where that's coming from, but that gives you two different PDFs that answer those questions <laughs> as to what top ten or what top twenty or top three or whatever it'll be in there. Um, so. Uh, I'm Sam Kaufman, uh, for those of you who don't know me, and thanks for showing up here. Uh, thank you for the the um, kind words about my book. And um, this is something that, uh, you know, Mason just asked me, hey, do you want to do an Ask an Herbalist uh, type of panelist thing? And I thought, yeah, that sounds like great fun. I love doing that. I love answering questions and sharing whatever experience I can that's of help to anybody else out there. I've been doing this for about 35 years or something like that. And I got into this um, prior to actually started getting into it prior to going back in the military the second time for me, which was as a special forces medic, which I always say is kind of like a cross between a combat paramedic and sort of a meatball uh, version of a nurse practitioner. Because, I mean, you only it's really a year solid of training of, in the Q course and qualification course to get through it. Uh, and it's a huge attrition rate, as you can imagine. Uh, but that's sort of the curriculum base is how would you take care of people in an austere environment where there's no higher care directly available and for me as a military person my medical director might be two thousand miles away how could they train a medic to do that well for me the question immediately became well how could i do this with herbs <laughs> and so i've been asking myself that question for you know well over 30 years and uh, i've created a a um a school <laughs> as an answer to that uh that's also about 30 years old if you go back to version 1.0 version 2.0 is about 16 or 17 years old and we are really in version 3.0 now i would say up here in taos new mexico we were in san antonio for about 15 years so um uh i um love to be able to work with an integration of different um paradigms of looking at the body and looking at health Right. That is Western medicine based for the first aid portion, especially. And we teach, of course, wellness first aid, advanced wellness first aid, and wellness first responder. And then we go beyond that. Uh, we have two different MDs on our faculty. One also used to be a former special forces medic and became an MD. And he's been an MD for almost 40 years in rural Utah. And so he and I have kind of put together this whole integrative medicine and austere medicine uh, with an herbal, a huge herbal component to that, of course. And then the other being Kyla Helm, who's also a former um, army doctor. And then she is a functional medicine practitioner. And so she and I have put together, we've worked together clinically for over 10 years with, with sharing patients and so forth. And so she and I put together the curriculum for our botanical functional medicine course, uh, which we've just continually evolving as well. Uh, so my point is that the integration of worlds of Western medicine and Western herbalism to me has been a really big goal for me. And then and then I also uh, finally I, I wanted to do this like 35 years ago when I went back in the military. I had made a choice between 
um, going in, back in the military to be a special forces medic and get that training or going to TCM school and becoming traditional my, Chinese medicine trained. And so after about 30 years or so, I made it, I was able to back off from the school far enough to be able to go back, go to school, go back to school and get my MSAOM from um, in San Antonio from THSU. So I have that and I'm finishing up my NCCAOM at one final um, board exam to, to finish to get my license as a doctor of uh, oriental medicine here in Colorado, or I'm sorry, New Mexico. And I'm considering going to school to get kind of the pinnacle degree in that, which is a DAOM or a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine, not because I need it to practice, but because I think it would be a great help for me in some of the things. So what I've done there has been uh, on the herbal side has really, it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. It's been very eye-opening to me to be able to work with a whole nother layer and a whole nother paradigm and integrate that in as well. And it is absolutely, it works to be able to do that. So I would say kind of an integrative medicine approach is where I'm coming from primarily. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and start pasting in some of the Q and A's and I'll answer some of your Q and A's as they come up. Uh, the first one literally that popped up was actually nothing to do with medicine. It was about the work that I'm doing with my dog who, if you can't hear her, she's chewing on a ball that makes it not a squeaky sound. It's actually very annoying. <laughs> I meant to not to give her a different ball to chew on. Uh, Lucy, and she's a Belgian Tavern. And um, the question is about that. So cause, so she's being trained. I'm on the canine. I'm on the actual board of directors for uh, Tell Search and Rescue as a liaison director. And I am on the canine team there. And we are working towards getting her and me uh, certified uh, for canine search and rescue here. And she is fantastic. Uh, we have rescued dogs for probably 20, 25 years and has some horrible stories that we've turned into beautiful stories in the short time. Sometimes that the dogs have been with us, we usually tried to rescue dogs that nobody else would take, um, you know, older dogs, especially, but, um, so that's where my heart's always been at, but for her, <laughs> When I decided I wanted to do the canine thing, it's like, I need a work dog. I can't, we can't do this with a rescue dog. Um, I would love to do it with a rescue dog, but I don't have the, the ability to, and it's very difficult to. So I actually went and got, uh, went out to California and got a work dog from a work dog breeder that breeds for for cops and for military, um, both Belgian Malinois and Belgian Tiburons, and mostly her, so her, her line is show, both show and performance. And she's, freaking amazing and the reason i went with belgian tavern is because i used to i, I rescued uh, one of our very first dogs was a belgian tavern um he was about a year and a half old and uh in denver and we live in denver still and he was the most amazing dog i'd ever had he was my my soulmate dog and i thought if i ever like get a work dog it's going to be this breed so they're like a long-haired version of a belgian malinois but they're much more of a thinking and a problem-solving dog than a mali is the malis have been bred to be really you know like rocket launcher you know <laughs> uh dogs so the joke is often well whatever the, the saying is amongst trainers that if you threw a ball off a thousand foot cliff a belgian malinois would jump off the cliff grab the ball and wag its tail all the way to the bottom and if you threw a ball off the cliff for a tavern they would spend an hour trying to figure out how to get down off the cliff you know they're very much a problem solving dog and that really fits well for a search and rescue so um that's uh that's kind of where i arrived at that um all right. So now I guess on to more herbal questions. Um, let me grab one. There was a Q&A. There's a couple of Q&As. Let me grab one here. Um, let me post that in the chat since it's easier for me to read it there. And feel free to, to post your or your questions in the chat as well. We bought the first or the herbal first aid kits. Wonder if you have instructions for the herbs so we can look over. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the best source of that information is probably going to be my book, to be honest, Herbal Medic. Um, in terms of understanding how to work with all of these herbs together. It doesn't specifically say, yeah, this particular formula in the kit, although it actually does. I mean, it, it'll talk about that. And that PDF that you can download also gives the formulas. It gives what they're used for. It gives the ingredients to each formula. Those formulas have evolved over the years. And so some of the ones you get at my store are not going to be exactly the same, but they're very similar and the purposes are very similar. And so that, that PDF will help you as well with that. So the book and the PDF, I would say, would be the, the best ways to, to, answer, to answer that question. There's another one here. Let me put it in the chat here. 
So another herbal first aid question. With herbal first aid situations, how do you manage the pain folks have to deal with from tourniquets and reside or movement? Yeah, that's a good question. Tourniquets are very painful. You have to keep them from touching the tourniquet, and that is not easy to do. Um, really, I mean, if you're carrying somebody, if you're if there's if they're on a stretcher anyway, they're going to be you're gonna or a backboard, they're gonna be fastened down and they're not gonna be able to get to it. Um, but it's it's difficult. And that said, my experience with tourniquets in the field in the military was on people that were were unresponsive. Um I don't know. I can't think of a time I put a tourniquet on somebody who was responsive. Um, so uh, that, it makes it easy because they're not responding to pain at all. Uh, but yeah, if somebody who is responsive to pain, that's going to be a problem. And so you might have to, you know, bind it. Um, we get into that in the osteo medicine program a lot, uh, it, talking, it's a big subject as to how to convert a tourniquet. Say you're in the field, you throw a tourniquet on, you save, you know, you save a life, but you're going to lose a limb because higher care is 24 hours or a week or whatever. Maybe you don't even know if higher care is ever going to be available. How do you deal with that? And so the conversion from a tourniquet to a compression dressing is a, um, is a very interesting topic. And so uh, both from uh, research that's out there, and it's not, there's not a lot of research, there's not a lot of field experience out there for it. But from that, that, that is out there, and from just kind of our own experience and medical experience, Dr. Uh, Pearson and myself have sort of put together our own product protocol that follows all of that, and how we would do that both from a standpoint of if we were just working only with non herbal, you know, if we didn't have any herbs, and then also, you know, what if we did have herbs, where would we where would those fit into that process as well of converting a tourniquet into a compression dressing and saving a limb. And then, of course, that gets into vascular surgery in the field, which we get into a little bit in the osteo program as well. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. All right, let me go ahead and copy the next one from YouTube. Okay, this is an interesting one here as I look at it. Are there specific herbs that you recommend that we don't use together for whatever reason? Um, so in Western herbalism, not really. There's not really... I mean, there's some common sense stuff like you, you might not want to put something like a soporific herb, like an herb that will make you want to go to sleep along with, you know, in an energy formula that you're trying to do for somebody who's really, you know, trying to have more energy, for instance, which is, that's a pretty, you know, silly example. But, you know, I mean, there, there's just the purpose of the herb. But herbs cross purposes a lot. And in Western herbalism, really the only kind of rule, quote unquote, that's been out there for a while has been not to mix alkaloids with tannins. But even that is not really, I don't know how real or accurate that is. In other words, that if you were making a formula, and the reason for this is the fact that tannins and alkaloids can bind together and then basically reduce the efficacy of both the tannin and the alkaloid in your body because they're bound and they just you know, become digested that way and exit. So uh, then example would be like oak bark with say, um, uh, you know, berberis species like like um, algorita or, or whatever, common common barberry or whatever, because you've got the, ber ber the berberine or golden seal. Berberine uh, mix uh, binding with a tannin, with the tannins from say oak. And so that's, that's kind of like one thing that's been passed down for quite a while. But again, I don't know how much I really even know that that's applicable or true. I don't know. But that's just one of those things that I don't think there's a lot of research out there. I talked to, I think with Lisa Gnor about this for a while, and I think she kind of agrees with me on that, that it's really, there's not really any research that shows that that's absolutely what's going to happen. But if you go to TCM, it's a whole different world. There are definitely herbs that you're not supposed to, you know, that, that are supposed to, they can antagonize. There's all these different um, concepts and terms that can happen. Uh, you know, so an example would be like, again, uh, a berberine containing herb like coptis, like Chinese coptis, right? That's kind of like the, uh, you know, this is a maybe the golden seal or, or maybe better the, the algorita root of TCM to some extension, extent, right? With berberine as well. Well, you're not supposed to, that'll antagonize like chrysanthemum. That'll antagonize like um, scrofularia. That'll antagonize um, 
Um, I, I call it oxygen. It's atria antispidentata, and I use that a lot. So, you know, they're supposed to be um, herbs that will um, antagonize, that will contradict and each other and so forth too. Not supposed to be, there are. But that's because the um, the herbal uh, materia medica and sort of the compendium of how herbs work is a very specific um, set of um, detailed sort of both energetic and physical mappings to these herbs. Excuse me. So if you have, so kind of an interesting thing with TCM is, you know, if, a, if, if, a, if there's a question about an herb or a formula, there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. And you don't really find that with Western herbalism much. And there's a lot of reasons for that, that I won't, I mean, that would, it would I could talk for an hour on that term, on that topic, and some of it has to do, I think, with our lack of um, standardized, um, some sort of standardized education around medicine in the herbal community. Uh, but some of it has to do with just the fact, too, that um, we don't know uh, when you're looking at it from a Western perspective, because we're approaching it from this kind of pharmaceutical idea that we're born into, since about the 1910s, we're born into this concept of um you know, one pharmaceutical or, or one symptom, one term is pharmaceutical. And uh, this whole mapping of of medicine is completely different than a mapping that you're going to get in TCM. Okay. Um, let me uh, grab this one off of Q&A and put it into chat. Speaking of dogs, my one and a half year old pup seems to have an allergy system issue. So reverse sneezing. I mean, goldenrod glycerin, sure. Okay. Um, the vet suggested steroids. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, no, I think the goldenrod's a great, you know, is a great approach for that, for sure. And I think it's gentle enough that you can use that with the dog for quite a while as a glycerin, as a glycerite. Um, uh, I think that's I mean, some of the others that I would use for humans are, I think, too strong for a dog. Like, like Grindelia would be a great one. Yerba Santa would be a good one for a human. Um, um, yeah, I mean, Mullen Leaf would be okay and might be useful there. Um, ironically, as much as I've done with the hooks for both training and now, you know, search and rescue, I really haven't worked a lot with dogs from a, from a medicine standpoint. I, I mean, I have some for sure, but um, more simple stuff, and I've not really ever devoted a lot of time to that. The person that's really good at that, by the way, that I really highly respect is Cat Lane. Um, as a practitioner, she's fantastic, in my opinion, and of course, a lot of nutrition. I think she's got a website, and her on Facebook is called The Possible Canine. So that would be a good place to check in, and she would probably have some great advice there, too. Um, okay, let's see here. Let's go to the next one here. I would love to ask about, let's see here. Oh, okay. So this is more of kind of a motivational question. Um, I would love to ask about how to keep the continued motivation up when the world tries to get in the way of your progress. Uh, yeah, if you're talking about me specifically, uh, that's sometimes, uh, that's something that I didn't used to be a problem, but it's become more of a problem. And I... You know, I guess I don't mind. I've shared. I know with students and classes. I mean, I had I had COVID in uh, about a year. Was it a year ago? A year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. And um, yes, Hillary, to change the subject real quick, back nettles leaf is, would be great for that. Bromelain would be good. Carson, all of those would be useful for a pet as well. For for a dog, uh, no problem with you know being too strong or being a problem there. Um. So I had COVID in August of 2022 when we first moved up here and it was, we were still living in the RV waiting to close on this property and we were at about 8,500 feet or so and uh, it was the sickest I've ever been and I'd had all the vaccinations and boosters because my wife Suchel uh, was entering nursing school at the time and she had to have all of them and I just kind of in solidarity I got them along with her you know I didn't really care one way or the other to be honest. And so, um, anyway, I got really, really sick. I mean, respiratory, uh, one, the first night I, I had it, I was, I didn't know for sure I was going to be able, I could, I couldn't breathe, you know, and especially at altitude and my SpO2 was like, you know, in the mid eighties, it was really bad. 
So uh, the next morning, Sucha went down and got a whole bunch of herbs because we didn't really have much. I had some tinctures, but I didn't really have any herbs or any RV. And so there's an herb store in Taos, and so she brought them back, and I did some steam inhalation, and I got, like, within hours, I started to improve just incredibly. But I got, my point to this is I got really bad long COVID that I think is neuroinflammation from that. And I, for the first time in my life, I've never had a problem with being motivated. I've never had a problem with any of that. And I, I just, I really had a problem for a while. I'd have some really bad days of what I would call depression. And um, for me, it was an eye opener. And I was like, oh, well, now I can empathize. You know, I've worked with people with depression, but I never really could empathize with it. Now I can, I understand now. Um, and maybe that was a good reason for it. What actually turned my the corner for me really well, I so I have a neuroregen formula that works really well, that helps a lot that, that I started using, uh, especially as a nausea oil, the oil, you know, into the nose, and then it gets into the bloodstream that way. And uh, so a lot of these, what I call neuroregen herbs, many of them come to us from TCM, but have been researched really well because of the fact that they do certain things in traditional Chinese medicine uh, that have been found to repair myelin sheath damage. So myelin sheath around neurons and decrease inflammation around in the myelin sheath. And so um, I started uh, I started working with that and that helped a lot. But what really turned the corner for me was an herb called Sananga that I used, um, which I had used before. Oops, S-A-N-G-A, there we go, Sananga. Um, I had used it before, about 10 years before, uh, and but more from out of curiosity because it's used in uh, the jungles of Peru to uh, for uh, tribes that will use it, indigenous tribes that will use it for increasing their night vision for night hunting. And my God, it's incredible how much it does increase the night vision. My first experience was it was at night in a little, um, in a hot springs, uh, a private hot springs down in Arizona where I was teaching at WFR. And just like from... The moment that it stings really bad, but when I was finally able to open my eyes, the bats that you could see at the far end, about 150 meters away, you know, from going from seeing like five or six bats when they'd go up against the horizon to seeing like 200 bats, you know, there and real, it was just incredible. So I was already impressed with it then, but then I, uh, it popped up again in a conversation. I thought, you know, I would like to try that again. Um, and I was a little curious, you know, about not, I wasn't curious about it for long COVID. I was just curious about its use for, you know, more on a spiritual level for vision, for inner vision. So it's spelled up above, Cat. It's S-A-N-A-N-G-A, Sananga. Um, a place called Four Visions is, I think, a reputable place and doesn't, it isn't just a, um, I think Four Visions Apothecary or something like that. And they are, um, they have a, um, um, they have a uh, nonprofit that gives directly to the tribes that harvest this and they harvest it with um, like a a tannic acid, which is called, which causes a really deep sting for the eye drops. So this got me thinking about number one, intraocular administration of herbs, because as soon as I opened my eyes up from this, this dosage and I accidentally got the extra strength, I didn't mean to. And it was, it was like getting kicked in the liver. I was like in a fetal position for a while outside. And I, I linked up with the plant. Like I could see myself, and Lucy was like about 13 weeks. This was almost a year ago. I had just gotten her and she was sitting there and I could see myself through her eyes and I could hear the plant in my head saying, you know, well, hello again, because uh, we had, you know, it, this is it's a very powerful plant. And um, it was just like somebody took a curtain and, and parted it from all of this really weird, you know, brain fog fatigue and depression and stuff and and my motivation and so everything went up so this is a long-winded answer about my own kind of battle with that i would say it's maybe a big word but a a little bit of a battle with the whole depression thing and the long covid and being the only time in my life i haven't been motivated so that was me but the question may have been totally generic as to just how does one do this? Well, learning herbs and working with herbs is a very non-linear process. And so what I suggest is you follow your heart, you follow your intuition, and you work your way through subjects that are of interest to you. And you let the plants guide you in that because they'll tell you. The plants will speak to you if you listen, if you're if you're open to it and you're listening to them. And if you want to be a good herbalist, you have to do that. And this isn't woo. This is our relationship our physical relationship with the planet uh, as a human species um, there plant medicine is living medicine it's not dead medicine it's not pharmaceutical medicine it's not molecular compounds that have been developed somewhere in a lab 
It is living medicine and breathing medicine. And so you have to be in tune with that too. And to do that, you just do it. The better, the more you do it, the better you'll get at, at doing that. And that I think is a very, uh, well, it's probably the biggest thing that's, that I could think of that I, I would say is helpful motivation wise. Okay. Oops. All right. Sorry. I was, um, I posted all this stuff. My gosh. Sorry. I wasn't paying attention. Hosts and panelists. Here we go. Okay. So, Kathleen, hey, you know what? Why don't you go back to your, go on, back to your plots. Go on. You're really being a pain. There you go. You girl. Sorry, Lucy's sitting there, like, chewing like crazy on this ball, and she's knocking the, the heck out of the table and jerking the, 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 um, the, uh, uh, the video camera around. Okay. All right. So you got Cat Lane, because I was to host some panelists. You got Sananga. Um, because should have got four minutes. So that's to host some panelists. Um, that's all I see. I'm sorry, Mason. I only have two choices. I can host do it to host and panelists or Mason or to you. Um, okay. So if you can pass it on, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Mason. Um, I see to everyone. Yeah, that's not a choice. Gotcha. I wasn't paying attention there. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We got, how come the medical community Toronto Pen Company? Okay, here we go. Let's see here. Okay. So let me paste this back in just so I can see it. Oops, that's to, oh, here we go to everyone. That's better. Let me do it again. Okay, so I'm reposting what, what had already been posted above there. How come the medical community frowns upon compounding herbs and still insists on reduction of medicine? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who knows why the medical community does anything? And it's, you know, I mean, it's financial based, right? And the FDA is in a pocket of pharma, big pharma. And big pharma is one of the most powerful lobbying agencies in our country. So they write the rules. Um, this can be to our advantage. It happened with the Deshay Act in 1995 that Big Pharma was so invested, or the the supplement industry, which in my opinion, Big Pharma was invested in very much, was by that point even probably a billion dollar um, you know, revenue um, industry, uh, was able to put a leash on the FDA, right, at that point with the Deshay Act. But in return, were the CN CGMP protocols that then needed to be rolled out in the 2000s, the early 2000s, which were also to the benefit of big pharma or a big supplement industry, it's a nutraceutical industry, because your larger companies will have no problem, you know, with a million dollar um, investment to be able to make sure, you know, an a facility is G CGMP compliant, whereas a mom and pop shop would have a real hard time with that. So it was, again, uh, to their advantage. But out of that process, the amount of marketing, um, the, the amount of marketing and the amount of um, um, money in supplement industry, I think really was has been to the benefit of herbalism in general. So it is no longer like when I first started 35 years ago, when you had to look over your shoulder all the time, and this was in Colorado and in Texas also, you know, you really had to be always watching. I had probably a phone call a month when I first started our clinic, our student clinic down there from people that were obviously fishing to try to entrap me in something, you know, people that have read one of my blogs and they'd call up, which is, and it would always be like an Austin number, you know, probably from the state, some sort of a state official. And it would be, um, you know, somebody saying, Hey, I read in your blog about, you know, whatever snake bites or this or that, or, and my brother got one. And can you tell me, you know, can you, can you um, treat my brother with this? You know, they start using the verb words, words like that. I mean, it's so anyway, it's not like that now at all. And in New Mexico is great. Um, because of the, the um, well, I can talk about that. And I think there's some questions about that too. But anyway, uh, I think that who knows around the medical community, what they frown on with compounding herbs and still insist on reductionist medicine. That's a good question. It's uh, another paradox. Echinacea is fine to combine with elderberry. I have a, I have one of my four elderberry formulas, and it's, uh, I think it's called elderberry echinacea, and it's a glyceride. It's an alcohol glyceride of echinacea and an alcohol glyceride of, of, um, of elderberry. In other words, it has like less than 1% alcohol, and then I started off with alcohol. I get rid of the alcohol during the glyceride process with heat, and then uh, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very potent 
glycerite, so that can be taken by kids as well. Okay. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just got a note. I wanted to make sure it wasn't for something here. Okay, and I got Q and A. Yes, I'm aware of that, Mason. I was kind of I've, I've been um, copying and pasting Q and A questions as well. Uh, so coming back in here to Q and A, I've been trying to go back and forth on it. Okay, let's go to everyone and post it here. What is the harvesting window for wild cherry bark? And how soon is it? You can harvest wild cherry bark anytime, but the best time is in the spring, especially if you live in a colder uh, colder climate. Absolutely, in the spring is a great time to do it. Um, you can use it fresh. You can use it dried. It's fine. Um, but what you need to do with it first, in my opinion, is do a cold water infusion with it first and then put it in the heat. So sort of like marshmallow. It, I use it the same. I, I make I do a similar thing with marshmallow root and with a lot of different um, mucosal vulnerabilities with, with a lot of high heat or polysaccharide content. Is a cold water soak first and then add it to the heat. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, there's a question here about, um, I'll pass it on to the, everybody, what do you recommend to help my immune system get rid of this deep mucus once and for all from, from long COVID? This comes up a lot. This is an issue definitely that's happening. So number one, a TCM approach is very useful here too, but that requires, you know, full intake. It's different for everybody as to what's going on there. It could be lung chi deficiency. It could be phlegm. It could be phlegm heat. It could be related to even to something in the middle jowl, uh, working its way up. Um, it can be a relationship between the kidney and the lung. Depends on, you know, the person is basically a syndrome differentiation based upon, you know, a, a lot more information than that. However, from a Western perspective, pleurisy root is your friend. Thyme, vulgar, thymus vulgaris is your friend uh, to help nurture the cilia cells in particular. Pleurisy root is a deep expectorant. Elecampane is your friend, another very good deep expectorant. Uh, for inflammation, yerba santa and grindelia, even though they're a little more drying, are also very useful here. Okay. Um, sorry, I realize, you know, I'm taking a long time to answer some of these questions. So I'm going to go here. Let me go ahead and... And I'll come back around to the to the YouTube questions too. Uh, so some the same person that asked about the cherry tree bark who cut two months ago left outside can still be harvested for a bark. Yeah, if it wasn't sitting out in direct sunlight during that time, if it was in the shade or or in you know undercover, then yes. How do you recommend a hobbyist herbalist Western to just get better at diagnosis? Uh, good question. Um, use Western, use Western symptomology and Western soap node approach, in my opinion. Um, if you come to our class, if you, you know, if you're taking our, our classes in our clinical program, I do a soap note class. I have 30, there will be 32. There's been 16 of them so far, and there's going to be another 16 this next year. So basically on a two year cycle, uh, once a week for eight weeks at a time, uh, twice a year. So on the summer, spring, summer, or summer, fall, whatever, and then winter, spring. Uh, and so what it is, is I role play. And these are based on cases that I've had. I have thousands and thousands of cases drawn on based on, on cases I have. Each time will be a different Western diagnosis. You know, um, it might be interstitial cystitis one week, and it might be um, a, a wound infection the next week or whatever. And so I will um, have a chief complaint. And then students, they already know the, the S and the O and really the A. I mean, or both. The S and the O, I'm giving them my subjective and objective. And the A of what they actually have, the assessment, they already know. So all they have to do really is, is get protocol. Uh, I want herbal protocols from them. And that, and then over the course of two hours, and then they get two hours of clinical credit for that. And, and so for those who are starting out that are building their clinical hours, it's a great way to do that. That gives you a chance to ask questions, to hear other students asking questions, to kind of put it all together, and then um, you know figure out the subjective and objective questions that you need to ask. There are numerous different mnemonics, and the ones that we learn really in first aid, like in WFA and WFR classes, work for everything. But you can go a little bit deeper if you want to. Those are um, you know the the. Uh, mnemonics for pain, for instance, the OPQRST. I, I won't write all this out. It would take too long. But uh, the mnemonics for um, how we get information, sample, the sample history. So subjective, sorry, uh, O, uh, for example, A stands for you know allergies, M stands for medications, and so forth. And in each of those, you can go down deeper levels. So I would suggest, and I'll just write this out here because without writing out what each letter means, and then OPQRST, 
is honestly a great way to start. And I, it helps me. I still to this day, just today, I had a client where um, she was actually giving me information for another person um, who wasn't able to, you know, to, to do that herself. And, uh, you know, in that, you know, talking about pain, it's like those questions. And it's just natural now for me to ask, you know, does it radiate anywhere? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Is it a sharp pain? Is it a dull pain? Is it a burning pain? What are, you know, so these are the things that you learn to ask from something as simple as sample and OPQRST, for instance. Okay. Uh, is there anything recommend herbally to get warts off the body? Yeah, there are some herbs that we can use topically for that, Lauren, uh, to be able to work with um, uh, um, warts. So one of the classics in Western herbalism actually is, um, 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 sorry, I just said enough thought. Um, one of the classics uh, in Western herbalism is the juice of the um, uh, prickly poppy. All uh, right. Um, the um, Argemony, sorry, Argemony species. So like Mexican poppy, it's it's this orange um, Argemonine, and it's 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 an orange looking uh, sap uh, that that works. Uh, but that's something you're not going to find online or anything like that. Um, otherwise, you know, and there are other there are other topicals we can put on there as well. Um, honestly, though, you know what they use is just. Uh, um, you know, the same acid that is our aspirin, right? Uh, acetylsalicylic acid, or I'm sorry, salicylic acid to be able to, if you buy like a wart remover type thing. And so that works pretty well. Honestly, those wart remover um, our topicals are, are useful there too. Um, would you say how you make your alcohol glyceride? You're welcome, Mark. Um, Yes. So the way that I do that, uh, Diana, is by... Um, soaking in alcohol so do you know how to make an alcohol salve it's the exact same process as an alcohol salve or an alcohol oil you soak in alcohol first just enough to super you don't want a lot because you got to evaporate it off you don't want to have a whole bunch to deal with just enough to be able to super saturate soak it anywhere from 20 minutes to 24 hours depending on what you want to do really and on what your preference is there's a definitely a diminishing returns at a certain point but um, I usually do it for a couple hours and then you put it in with your glycerin and you stir it and you make sure you can evaporate so you have no lid on and you evaporate all your alcohol off. And when it's gone, you won't smell anymore, just like you do with an alcohol salve. It'll be gone. You won't and and you have to be careful though, because and especially don't put it on an open flame to do that, because what'll happen is that alcohol glycerite is a little different than an alcohol oil, and it'll end up bubbling up. Uh, especially if there's like a lot of plant matter, when it kind of burps, it'll bubble up and you'll end up with this sort of like a champagne glass bubble, you know, on your pot. It'll come up and if it spills over the side, <laughs> it's all alcohol and it'll cause a serious fire. Um, and I speak from experience there. So be really careful how you do that, how you evaporate and better to do it like on a, at least on an electric burner, but um, to watch for that bubbling and keep it a very alcohol boils at 170 something 174 degrees fahrenheit and you're evaporating it literally at like 120 130 degrees fahrenheit so you don't have to have a lot of heat for this to, to work uh when processing violet i have much more leaves than flowers but will it make yes it still will absolutely work uh, oh here let me repost that here also to everyone i see so when you post a question in chat i see what happens here so it goes to hosts instead of everyone so um, yes, you're fine with the leaf as well on that. C. Um, okay, let me go here to can pyrolyze. Oh, this is a good question here. Jim posted. Oh. Um, can a pyrolyzing alkaloids be easily removed from comfrey? And what is the method? There is a method to remove pyrolyzing alkaloids. I don't know that it's easy. The one that is used that I know of is more kind of a lab uh, thing. And I don't know if there's like a commercial version of that. I i don't know. It's been a long time since I looked into this, but it was they were using, I think, bentonite clay to be able to do it. And I don't remember the exact process, but it sounded at the time I was really interested in getting into it. And it just became too complex, too complex and kind of a kitchen apothecary setup for me. That may have changed over the years. Another thing to consider is that um, licorice, 
<laughs> has been shown, um, at least in some research based on Chinese medicine, uh, because it's, licorice is used a lot for this purpose in formulas to ameliorate or mediate the toxic um, properties of some of the herbs in the formula. Well, licorice has been shown to actually um, do that and ameliorate the properties of pyrolysing alkaloids that otherwise will, will harm the liver. There's an interesting research paper out on that. Uh, Lisa Ganora has a great class on pyrolyzed alkaloids. I recommend checking out. I think it may be on demand and you can get it. I know she did it live and she may have a recording that's available too. Lisa Ganora is, if you look up her name and it's Elderberries is the name of her school. And her book is called, um, I think, Herbal Constituents. It's herbalconstituents.com. Fantastic book. I recommend it highly. Okay. So soaking the herb too long in alcohol, no, it will not decrease its alcohol uh, value. I was just, what I meant by that, Betsy, was that soaking the herb, there's a point where you're not going to get anything else out of it with the alcohol. So soaking at 48 hours versus 24 hours, or even 24 hours versus 12 hours, you really gain that much more in that extra 12 hours. And my answer is probably not. Really, a couple of hours is all you need, in my opinion. But it doesn't hurt. If you want to leave it longer, it's not, it's not going to hurt anything. Okay, let me go grab another YouTube question. Um, here's another top 10 herbs. We've already answered that. Um, here's one that I have not even thought about. Nobody's ever asked me before. Let me post that one in. What was the best advice you'd received starting out on your herbal path? And what do you wish you'd learned or didn't done sooner? I never really got any advice. I was self-directed completely. Um, so the only medical advice that I got was to not study herbs, that it was a waste of time, whereas the major in the charge of the Q course down in San Antonio, and it was called the 300 F1 portion of the Q course at that time, said, it's a bunch of horse shit. So, you know, and that was pretty much the attitude of the military. And certainly I was even working with team members when I was on an SF team that would bring me their families. I mean, they would, they would rather come and work with herbs because they saw it was working than they would go to the doc. But if they direct, if the medical director had found out about it, I would have gotten my ass chewed for that. So um, herbal advice. So from actual herbalists. Yeah, I couldn't say, but um what do I wish I'd done or learned, or learned or done sooner? I kind of wish, I wish I could have gotten into TCM earlier, uh, but I just, you know, if I had, I wouldn't have had the, the bandwidth to do what I've done with the school. So everything has its time, right? And, you know, I mean, I regret, I've gone through some regret stuff on other things in my life because I was a, a professional jazz pianist for a weird period of time. I started out as a classically trained pianist at the age of five, and I had the misfortune of being good enough to win a bunch of classical competitions and very ambitious parents, in particular a mother. And uh, I hated I hated music, really, by the time I was in high school, but I got into jazz, met Dave Brubeck through some friends, and it was like this huge thing for me. And so, and I won a bunch of composition comp competitions as well. And so after my first term in the army i got back at, and near the end of it i started getting back into music so i spent a lot i spent thousands of hours you know practicing writing playing performing getting gigs getting everybody paid on the gigs recording i have a couple cds out for, for, for posterity's sake if you're interested it's sam kaufman.bandcamp.com a couple of cds out um very much original um jazz avant funk a lot of different things um but there are times where i really regret all of those hours that i spent on that that i could have spent studying medicine you know maybe i would have, i got into medical school when i was 42 and i had to walk away for financial i had to choose between family and, and med school really is what it came down to and i walked away but if i'd started earlier would i have gotten through it and if i had would i be where i'm at now probably not you know because doctors can't do what i'm doing um, at least not, especially not back then. It was practicing way outside the scope of your license. So who knows, right? I mean, you have to, um, you have to just take where you're at and move forward. There's no going back. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. What was the question? What is maca root good for? John says, I don't really work with maca root, but you know, it's used, in my opinion, it's kind of over. It's one of those oversold kind of culturally appropriated um, herbs, I, you know, that's for energy. And, and this whole kind of idea of 
adaptogenic, you know, power and energy and stuff, you know, and I sell, I mean, we have a mitochondrial supporter. I have a libido and energy formula in a store. I have a core energy that's more based on TCM, yin and yang support of the kidneys. That's not the same as like adaptogenic concepts. The adaptogenic concepts came around with Siberian ginseng in the 50s with Soviet Union, drowning rats and putting a, giving them Siberian ginseng and saying, well, they swim longer in a futile position. Uh, instead of swimming for t- an hour before they drown, they, they swim for two hours before they drown. And as Paul Bergner said very wisely, well, why don't they just take them out of the water? You know, and that's really, so this idea of more energy that, you know, Maka, gives you and everything so that you can tackle more stress and load more stress on is just it's such a misnomer or so you know it's just a fallacy in my opinion so that's really all i really know maca root for i don't buy it i don't use it i know that it's it's at risk or at least i believe it is and so i when i first saw that it's like i'm not using it um uh jim quite answer the question Oh, here we go. Yeah. Is there any evidence that using rosemary in a diffuser or an essential oil will help with memory? No, not really, probably. But it's. I think rosemary is a fantastic herb as a kind of a mental nervine. And I like to use it in formulas for that. Uh, so it might. And I am strong. I do like diffusers. I think the diffusers, one of the few uh, applications of aromatherapy and of, of essential oils that I, that I agree with, um, and then also using them as a uh, sometimes as an additive to things like salves, I am very much a fan of. But using them otherwise, you know, <laughs> a la, you know, young living or old dying, as I call them, or whatever, it's not, I don't think is. I don't think, uh, I think there's a lot of oh, crap there. But um, whether or not it will help with memory in a diffuser, I, I really don't know. And I don't know if there's any evidence for it. I would suggest trying it and seeing what you think, you know, because it's going to vary for person as well. Uh, great. Thank you, Kelly Marie, on Lisa Ganor's um, uh, site. Highly recommend it. And thank you, Betsy. Yes. Herbal Medics. So herbalmedics.academy, if you don't already know, is our school. AKA the human path. The human path is what we first started out at. And um, then uh, there is just so much herbal we had to kind of separate from all the survival courses and stuff because people were getting confused. So it's sort of like uh, doing business as the human path. Um, paralyzed Dean, Kelly Marie, I answered your paralyzed Dean alkaloid question. Hopefully you missed that. Um, okay, anything else? <laughs> Thanks, Betsy. Appreciate the kind words. Um, what resources, websites do you use to keep current? Yeah, that's a good question. It really, it's all about um, it's all about for me. Um, if I want the the only really research that I do is when I want to find out about medicine making for some specific herb, or there's something maybe that popped up in TCM that's being used. Maybe, for instance, uh, like there's a yawn tonic, like a kidney yawn tonic in. TCM recently that I was looking into Sistanchis. And um, it's, you know, and, and so I thought, well, is there research on this? And there is, of course. And there's research that says that it can promote testosterone uh, development and and um, and maybe growth hormone support and so forth. And that's the case with a lot of things, right? From fenugreek to, to epimedium and, and so forth that you find in TCM being used as John tonics. And so then what I'll do is I'll go and say, well, what are the constituents that we say are the ones, and even though I know that that's not always accurate as to what the plant's actually doing, what are the active constituents? And then I'll say, well, what is the solubility of these active constituents? Okay, there's two or three constituents that they they are saying, we pull these constituents out and we say that see that they actually promote testosterone levels, right? It's like, okay, are they water soluble? Are they alcohol soluble? Are they oil soluble? Are they polar, nonpolar, and so forth? What kind of what kind of molecules are they? What are their functional groups? And then that's what I'll that's the kind of research I usually end up doing. And it'll it'll guide me into like doing a multifractional extract of saying, I'm going to do alcohol first on this one, or I'm going to do water first on this one, or whatever it ends up being. Um that's how I really keep up. I don't really do much else. I don't even really keep up with TCM stuff much. I'm on a lot of different newsletters and such, but most of the stuff that comes out is just, it's verifying what I'm already doing, honestly. Like, it's like, oh yeah, well, that's great. You're going to see now pretty soon, I'm sure, 
um, all of these different TCM herbs that are neuroregenerative herbs is going to make the headlines, splash headlines in TCM newsletters eventually. It's like, great, thanks. I found that out about 12 years ago, and I've been, that's what's gone into a lot of my formulations. So a lot of that happens. I don't mean to sound like egotistical about it. I'm just saying that um, a lot of that information changes all the time. And so coming back to the basics actually helps me more than anything. Um, and TCM has been a, a big journey back to the basics for me, actually. Um, okay. Would you use a paste of honey and oregano to help? Some, um, maybe, you know, um, eczema is so if you're talking about just topical use of something to be able to help that calm down, I would suggest other one. I would suggest more herbs that are going to be, uh, strong, um, like inhibitors uh if you're doing a met western strong inhibitors may be of histamine reaction and of or just of, of mast cell inhibitors seems to help a lot something that steroids do for instance when we give it to somebody for put it on the cream for, for eczema seems to work the same way i have this formula called mi i think it's a mast cell inhibitor on in a store and it's um and you can look at the content or the ingredients on that and that's there's a lot in there that a research i did at that time to try to see what herbs really help inhibit and it works topically as well even though it's a tincture you can do that as an oil um will oregano and and um, honey it, it sure it might help the the sometimes eczema is pretty wet and in that case the honey might just exacerbate a little bit too um for eczema or any autoimmune or autoallergic reaction really what we have to do is we have to get into more of the depth of the balance and imbalance going on in the body is what I found. And that's where TCMs help me. Instead of playing whack-a-mole with hormones or with different types of inflammatory cytokines, it's just a game of whack-a-mole from a Western perspective. And it's even worse than pharmaceutical medicine because you don't have the strength of pharmaceutical medicine that you do with herbs. Herbs are known do not work in the same way at all. So to approach it from that standpoint is kind of a this whole medical herbalism little thing that's happened, um, I just, I've played that game and it's difficult, you know, to really get a, get true lasting uh, effects. There are times where it, it helps a lot, especially with like trauma-induced stuff, surgery-induced stuff, you know, where you can fix that. If you can just fix that tissue with the herbs, you're going to, you're going to start the healing process from there out, um, you know, kind of from the inside out. But, you know, when it's things like that are autoimmune, that are related to maybe long-term exposure to toxins or just autoimmune issues through, you know, gut stuff and 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 food and nutrition and um, lifestyle and stress and, and, you know, perimenopausal issues and all the stuff that comes around and suddenly Hashimoto's pop, pops up because the thyroid is like, I can help, you know, with all this stuff and the cortisol levels have changed. You just play in whack-a-mole with that, with those kinds of concepts with um, herbs is just not really an effective way. And that's where TCM has been a huge, just like it's blown this stuff out of the water for me because it works so well to approach it from that standpoint. Okay. Um, go back up to here. Oh, thank you, Jim. Uh, great. The book. Yes. Herbal Medic is a book. Uh, uh, thanks, Giovanna. Giovanni. Giovanna, sorry. Um, Probably Herbal Medics Academy is what you mean, Giovanni. Herbal Academy is totally different, just so you all know. Herbal Academy is nothing like us at all. So um, Herbal Medics Academy, I know it's like kind of confusing because we were Herbal Medics University, but then we got slapped on the wrist or in the hand. We're using the term university in Texas, and you can only do that if you're an accredited higher education facility. Uh, another thing to do, Ash is asking about that. Let me give you a link here, Ash, that might be helpful for you and for anybody that's wanting to know this, and that's Dr. Dukes. Dr. Dukes is a great place. It's not by any means complete, and the data is changing. Dr. Dukes passed away, unfortunately, a while back, and the data doesn't really get updated much, but it still is a great place to start. You can go there, and you can type in the name of a plant, and you can see all of the constituents that have been identified. Or you can go there and type in the name of a constituent, and you can see that constituent of what plant part it's in, of what different plants. And that gives you a different, and you can, you can, org you can order the list by parts per million and so forth. So you can really get a better idea. So that's uh, a good place to start. Yes, thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Glad that's helpful there. And thanks, Mason, for the uh, Amazon link. And if you go, I do sell on the website as well. Um, 
if you pop in there and I, the, this is a signed copy. We can't compete with Amazon prices, so we have to charge like about five bucks more, but you get a signed copy. <laughs> that's how we that's how we compete. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, buy it from Amazon, it's fine. It helps me out, honestly, too. When did my Amazon sales like drives? It's been the top three bestseller for story publishing for the last two and a half years. So that helps. Amazon has helped on that. Uh, C says, I wanted to say to listen as a guest on podcast. Deterry, yes, absolutely. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, Deterry is a pretty amazing plant to communicate with. Thank you, C, as well, for the the, um, the wonderful words about my book. Um, okay, good. I can pop over here to check uh, Q and A. See on this. Um, okay, uh, interesting commentary on Maka. <laughs> Thanks, Mason. Uh, what about other adaptive notes like Rhodiola? Yeah, and I'm and I'm not. Um, I, I use Rhodiola a lot. I like Rhodiola, and I. I consider it more of a nervine, really, a calming, um, inner a focusing nervine, maybe would be a good word for that. And kind of in a kind of a um an amphoteric, maybe, an amphoteric adapter or an amphoteric nervine. So amphoterism, if you don't know, is a it comes borrowed from chemistry and it's a concept that um a compound can act paradoxically different in a base environment versus an acidic environment. And so we find that herbs are the same way. I mean, you can get the same herb acting different ways in your body. Well, why is that? Well, because there's thousands, maybe tens of thousands of constituents. Your body knows which ones it needs, usually, hopefully, and which ones it doesn't. And it works that way. So you can find herbs that have seemingly paradoxical properties, right? And and so rhodiola, in my opinion, is, is an amphoteric adaptogen. Um, ashwagandha would be an example of another amphoteric adaptogen that you know, there are times where you take ashwagandha and some people that can't tolerate it don't take it. But for those that, that like it, um, oftentimes you'll see they say, yeah, you know, I took it and I was really worn out and I just, it's like, it helped me get to sleep and I slept amazingly. And at other times, you know, it's like I took it and it was like, whoa, I couldn't believe the amount of energy I got from it. So concepts like that, I think, are, are important to pay attention to. And there's far more to into that than I can go into here. But um, that's an idea to think about another q a one about burns what therapeutic aids uh would support uh proper regrowth yeah so in my opinion like with any inner injury burns are no different in that regard <clears throat> it's all about returning circulation to the area as part of that development so um any injury has there's many ways to see it, but one way is it has four stages of of um, of healing. The first is hemostatic. The second is inflammation. The third is proliferation. Proliferation is also broken down into three subcategories, and the fourth is remodeling. With burns, sometimes that remodeling phase, which is years, sometimes after a couple of years, it'll take where our scar tissue starts to reform <clears throat> and is trying to reform. And so that's where we really look at circulation herbs as well. So herbs like Cola, herbs like red sage that are going to be able to move um, and help move blood and lymph through that area topically, especially, right? When we have a breakdown of tissue or injury, <clears throat> you have to remember we have these capillary beds that if, if everything is healthy, we have an arterial side and a venous side. And from the, you know, the hydrostatic pressure of the arterial side moves everything into the capillary beds. There are lymph capillaries there as well. And then from the other side is an osmotic pressure that flows back out of that venous uh, side and into the, into the back into the blood circulation to go to the liver, to be clean, to be, you know, to be metabolized, to be excreted, whatever, broken down and so forth. Those lymph capillaries in the capillary beds are incredibly important and something that's overlooked, in my opinion, by Western uh, pharmaceutical medicine a lot, but it's something that in herbal medicine we can absolutely affect. Topically is a great way to go with movers of lymph. And also we can take uh, oral, you know, uh, take take medicine orally that will help with lymph moving as well. And so salves are great there. Um, maybe even liniments if the sensitive, if the skin isn't too sensitive, 
Um, if you need a carrier, you can even use something like DMSO. That might be too much, you know, so it depends on, on the, the nature of the burn, the location of the burn, and the severity or the depth of the burn. <clears throat> okay. Uh, prostate cancer is a question that just popped up here. So I can't, and I'm not going to talk. Let me just repay, repost that. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about cancer. <clears throat> number one, because it's um, it's really out beyond my my experience level. I just don't. I've never, <clears throat> in my opinion, to be an herbalist and working with cancer, that's pretty much has to be something that's all you do. And there are some herbalists out there that are probably really good at that. Um, but I think you have to really be. It's it takes almost all your bandwidth to do that, and I and I haven't, so I can't. You know, just out of pure experience, bandwidth you know, pay grade, whatever, in the cancer area that I can't really speak to that. However, I can speak to prostate circulation back to the lymph. So the prostate is high, it's a large amount of lymph and tissue in it as well. So lymph uh, circulators that we can get into the prostate, and we can do that through also getting the lymph, the, the, the herbs, the tissue through like uh, enemas and suppositories is another way to be able to get the herb there as well. And so herbs that help move uh, lymph in the lower uh, half of the body. One of them is Ocotillo. I'll type these out. Another one is called um, Queen's Delight, which is um, Stalingia. Let me do Stalingia. And those are two really good ones for that part of the body. But of course, some of the classic ones like Red Clover uh, is a gentle one. Poke is a much more is a stronger one are are useful here as well. So moving lymph tissue is important. Moving um, circulation blood into the bloodstream and and around there, the capillary beds and the bloodstream in that area is also very important. So again, getting herbs to the tissue topically is is a, is a really big priority there. So, um, and this may even just be herbs that are including mucosal vulnerabilities. I had a patient once that had um, prostate cancer and then had surgery, had bad rectal bleeding, and um, the, the cancer was supposedly in remission, but um, he had a lot of um, trauma to that area and suppositories, like just with simple things like yarrow and plantain and um, uh, Prunella vulgaris, um, astragalus, were very, very useful for helping the healing of that tissue as well. Um, of course, nettles root, nettles seed are, are, are decent at getting things down to that area as well. Um, mullen root. Yes, Donald Yance. Did I just see that name came up? Uh, yeah, Chanco Cabrera, thank you, and Donnie Yance, absolutely. Two, I two people that that's what they do, and they're they're really good at it from what I hear. More on adaptogens. What about Alpinia? Is a question here. So um, I wouldn't call Alpinia necessarily an adaptogen, although it might be. But it is one of the ones I use. Alpinia oxyphila in particular is what I use for um, for. Uh, um, neuro regen, uh, neuro, so nerve or, or myelin sheath regenerative. So that's Alpinia. So this is a ginger relative, right? It's in the ginger family, uh, Xif Bilar. And then there's also Alpinia that's that's pretty well known is the Galanja, which is Galanja root. So the Oxyphila, you use the seed or the fruit, and the Galanja is the root that's used. Um, but the fruit of the Oxyphila is really interesting because it stimulates uh, mitochondrial production. It's so it's a mite, it's in my mighty mito um, formula, for instance. It is also a neuroregenerative herb, so it it repairs and helps repair male myelin sheath, and it is it does definitely give you a little bit of you know you can feel it when you take it. It's, but like all ginger related type herbs, and there's there's others uh, out there in the, in the same family. It tends to be a little bit uplifting and a little bit activating, right? For sure. So you could call it an adaptogen from that standpoint, I suppose. But I know that from you know from the standpoint of um, you know Western medicine, what I've done, that it is um, what I would call um, again a mitochondrial support herb, and um, um, 
a uh, a mitochondrial support herb and a um, neuroregenerative. Sorry, I was thinking of a few different things. I wanted to say from a TCM perspective also, right? Because it's um, Yi Jiu Ren uh, and used in TCM and it is considered a, a, a yon, and again, another kidney yon tonifier. It's very interesting that a lot of these herbs that we call adaptogens that help with energy, that help with mitochondrial support, oftentimes, or help with testosterone levels, um, are oftentimes kidney yon supporters in Chinese medicine. Okay, let me go check Q&A here, and then I'll have to go back to the... Um, so, yeah, we've got... That's fine. Uh, no problem on that, Mason. We'll go to 4.30, I guess, here. Sounds good. Hour and a half. Uh, let me just type this one in. Once toes are stubbed badly, or more seriously, a weight falls on the feet, and the tiny bones are broken. Ouch. Um, yes. Right. Well, so you got to be creative with things like this, right? Poulticine and so forth. This is why bandaging and splinting skills are so important, in my opinion, you know, when I teach them and why when we say herbal first aid, you got to remember, and I, I think I borrowed this, I overheard seven songs saying it once, and I thought it was a great statement. When you say the words herbal first aid, remember two of the three of those words are first aid. So you have to have some basic, um, you know, first aid um knowledge and part of and a big part of herbal first aid, or I'm sorry, a big part of like wilderness first aid, in my opinion, are bandaging and splinting skills. So how do we do that around the toe? Yeah, it's difficult, but um, things like vet wrap, right? Uh, Coban is is really good for stuff like that. You um, you know sometimes sports tape or what's called um, um, you know or or K tape, uh, kinesiology tape or L tape, Luco tape. All of those are different, have different applications. But K tape works really well because it it um, you know it has flexibility to it and it sticks really well to the skin. Um, you might find that you have to do, uh, usually with fingers, toes, anything that's kind of on the end of, you know, an extremity um, when you're doing it. Sometimes you have to do a wrap, like if you're doing something over the finger, you got to do wrap over this way, and then you do wraps this way. And you might have to do it a couple times. You have to make sure that you have something sticking to the skin. So that is, you know, or you can put it right into a sock when they go to bed. You can do something like a garlic sock concept. You don't use garlic for this, but you can use other herbs in there instead and put them in the socks and put their socks on their feet and they go to bed with that and it soaks into the bloodstream. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you, Mason. There's my Instagram, Herbal Medic Sam. I have a bunch of videos on TikTok, but I have not updated TikTok for a long time, but I still have a bunch in there. If you're interested, that's also Herbal Medic Sam. Um, Facebook page is, uh, I have a Facebook page that's got like, 30,000 people on it. It's called, um, let me find it really quick. I'll have to put the link in there. Um, I'll do that as I'm talking here. Um, okay, back to Q&A. Okay, oh, there's a long one on a, on a uh, musculoskeletal issues. How do you address rotator cuff coming out of place for the first time differently, herbally versus repeat incident? Yeah, that's too bad. So I assume you probably had a dislocation, a subluxation, a subluxation of the shoulder at some point. So um, here again, taping is your friend, especially for the ankle. Um, this is why I teach in our wilderness first aid class. I teach a technique of ankle taping that nobody seems like nobody uses and nobody knows called a heel lock. A heel lock and a basket weave together make a really good, strong support for somebody who has chronic ankle, ankle injuries so that they cannot hyperextend it, uh, whether an NV version or an, an E version. Um, uh, and uh, what difference is an herbal use approach for first ankle sprain? Um, yeah, so I see what you're saying here. All right, so some of the herbs that really can kind of help tighten up, right, are there herbs that help tighten up uh, connective tissue? And there are a few. One of my favorites for this is actually um, ladies' mantle, Alcula, uh, Alcamila vulgaris. Another one is yarrow. And yarrow also, um, you know, Achillium millifolium. And yarrow also is a, aside from doing that, is also a great, um, in my opinion, it increases the movement of, um blood and circulation through injuries as well speeding up the inflammation process so here's where the problem between something like tendinosis versus in the western if you're seeing it from a western side
what's the difference between tendinosis versus tendinitis? You know, so a tendinitis being more of an acute uh, situation where you have some sort of inflammation, you know, by Western standards, what they would call inflammation of the tendon or inflammation of the sheath or inflammation of something in that area uh, that is an acute thing that you can get versus something that is a long-term chronic problem where we keep re-injuring it or it's never, you know, in my opinion, here's where we go. We talked about the different stages of healing between inflammation and proliferation, right? Well, what I think happens and I've dealt with shoulder injuries too, dealt with meniscus tears, and I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and getting there, and plus my time in the Army with hauling around 70 to 100 pounds on my back all over the woods and jumping and all that stuff, um, was not kind of my knees, not kind of my shoulders either, and then BJJ, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, definitely put finishing touches on all of that for me. So I've dealt with a lot of these things. I had a dislocated you know, one time as well. Um, so what needs to happen here, in my opinion, from that cycle is, we have to somehow stimulate past that inflammatory stage into the proliferative stage. And that's where, where a tendinosis issue happens. So for instance, um, platelet rich plasma, PRP treatments, where they pull out your, your blood, they spin it down and they take your, your, your platelets and they put that back into your into the area. And it does this massive little inflammatory process in the area. Now for soft tissue, this is incredible. I went, messing around and and I used herbs of course although I don't treat myself very well I have to be honest so even though I say I use herbs I didn't really use them that well um during a, a year problem with torn rotator cuff muscles uh from grappling and uh and then I went in and just said screw it I'm gonna try this PRP and in like a after a year of messing around and having pain all the time in like two weeks it went away completely. I went and got one more treatment and it's gone completely. And I think what happens is that it stimulates. So what I'm talking about is stimulate an inflammatory process to get your body, get all the cytokines, get all the activity going to where we make it into the proliferative stage and just instead of just going on this constant repeat of inflammatory cycle over and over and over again, which I think is the tendinosis description. This is from a lay person's perspective. I'm not, you know, I don't have the training that an orthopedic doctor would or a surgeon or somebody like that. But this is where I think herbs, what I'm trying to do is translate where herbs work and how they work versus how Western medicine sees pharmaceuticals working, where they say, let's suppress the inflammation. Instead, what I say with herbs, I think what we do is we actually increase the inflammation and that cycle to where it moves fast enough to where we clean that all that crap out and we can get, begin the proliferation without continually in that, you know, that cycle. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. I was going to look it up and I got totally... Uh, obviously, uh, sidetrack there. Yes, there it is. Thanks, Mason. Uh, torn ACLs. Man, the knees are tough. They're just tough to deal with because of circulation. One thing that you can consider is, is uh, honestly, is um, dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, right? And I can't, you know, I would never, I can't put this on a product because it's not FDA approved, but um, get 99.9% .9 pure DMSO and add that in. It's miscible with water. It's miscible with alcohol, with, with alcohol, with um, isopropyl alcohol. Um, you have to be careful. You don't want to mix it in with something like alcohol, like uh, ethyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol, 91% or greater is okay because it evaporates so fast. But anything you put on the skin with DMSO is going to go into the skin and it's going to continue all the way in. So whether you're using... Uh, herbs with that or using it by itself. In my opinion, it's a really good way to reduce inflammation. It became famous back in the 60s uh, for racehorses, using it directly on racehorses and so forth. It's an industrial solvent. You know, <laughs> the first time I picked up a book about it, I opened up to a chapter and it says DMSO. I still remember, I and mean, this was like in 1985 or something. And I opened up this book and it said DMSO, wonder drug or industrial solvent? Question mark. I don't know why that never went away from my head. So it's, you know, it's like, a, I think, a paper mill byproduct. But I, but so you have to ask yourself, you know, what is its use here? And I think its use is it's an incredible carrier. It's incredibly anti-inflammatory. And that is maybe one way that you can try to get something in to an ACL issue where you're trying to get herbs into that. Okay. So, but again, I can only say that just in words. I can't put that into my products, but I do have friends and family products that have DMSO in them. And I've done that both with um, our 
salve that's i think we call the trailer runner salve and i've done it with our sports i think it's called the used to be called the workers on and now it's called like the athletes on or something like that and the results are freaking phenomenal i've used it on myself for this and the results are amazing in fact because i use cayenne in that liniment i'd be very careful and it took a little bit of trial and error and some of the error was very painful of using what percentage of cayenne and i use a really high school book unit cayenne i do like a 250k cayenne and i do a 91 percent isopropyl percolation with that um, or now i use heat actually too with it because that even pulls it out the, the capsaicin even better and then that is like maybe a three percent of vo by volume and the dmso about 20 percent by volume was about the magic number you start getting more like 25 percent dmso or five percent cayenne and it was like feeling like you had a chemical burn it wouldn't actually burn you but it would feel that way because that cayenne would go so deep and be so strong <clears throat> so um anyway would you use kiyaro internal or topical i would use it in topical um, more importantly than in internal. I don't know that you're going to get as much use from it topically for something like that. The problem with getting <clears throat> anything into the knee to, uh, orally, like through your, you know, through a, an oral use, is that the circulation <clears throat> into the synovial joint comes in through the bone, right? So you've got to figure out ways um, to be able to get the herb to the tissue. And, and unfortunately, with the knee and the knee joint and then the synovial fluid and <clears throat> that whole joint, it's very difficult to do that by just taking something orally. This is where an issue like with something like Lyme disease, you know, where you have a bacteria that's actually hiding out in joints. How do you get it out of there? You know, and so people have like these horrible aching knees and joints and <clears throat> that's, that's a problem. How do you chase the, the bacteria out of there in order to be able to get it to, um, get to be able to, to do something with it anyway <clears throat> um oh thank you kelly marie very much okay so let me go back we've got a few minutes left um here's one it's all caps i can't ignore it <clears throat> best herbs for blood pressure i actually have a formula and i'm not trying this is sounding like an infomercial i'm sorry but i have a formula on my it's called blood pressure support on my herbalfirstaidgear.com <clears throat> website and um let me just grab that real quick i probably could grab it real if i can find it there's my site and i know which page it's on here we go and here okay so you can go there and look at the ingredients on there and those are ingredients from a western perspective i would use so there's TCM uh, approaches to this. There's actually a TCM formula that was created for hypertension uh, called the Uncarian, Uncarian Gastrodia um, um, formula. And <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. Uh, so if you look at that formula, of course, a lot, most of them are TCM herbs you might not recognize, but that is an interesting formula that um, works with, uh, specifically with blood pressure. And you don't usually find TCM well, I shouldn't say that. This things have changed, but it was not really the case for a while, for a long while, that you would find TCM herbs that were just for like blood pressure or something from a Western perspective, because they would say, "Well, you can't just treat the blood pressure as a symptom, right? Really, we have to find the cause, and to do that, we have to do really a syndrome di uh, differentiation on this particular person." And it's going to change. It's going to be different. Is it because of kidney heat? Is it because of liver heat? And is it because of phlegm heat? Is it because of you know what is causing this? Um, and so it's interesting that there is an actual TCM um, formula for that. Um, I could probably find that for you too, real quick. Gastrodia and Uncaria. Here, I'll go to uh, American Dragon, which is a great site, by the way. And it's Gastrodia and Uncaria decoction. Here we go. Here you go. Yeah. That will give you all the herbs in there. Click on the herbs. And I, if you're interested in TCM, I highly recommend that site. Uh, Joel Penner who was an amazing um, TCM practitioner. Um, he passed away a few years back, and they still take those nations for the site. And if you like it and use it, give them something because they it's it's a really it's a great site. It got me through TCM school uh, in a lot of ways and helped me so much with the clinics. <clears throat> And you can also, in Zoom, uh, Mason, you can save it, I think, as a file, too. Okay, uh, back up here. Is this the type of stuff you'll be talking about in the upcoming pain class? No. And Suchel is teaching that class 
Um, and I'm not sure, I know she'll be talking about things like nociceptors and, and that type of thing and different types of pain. Um, and if you take my, my, um, my HMP class, herbal medics for professionals class, we get in, we have a whole, you know, week that we spend on just pain as well and nervines and so forth. But, um, I'm not sure exactly, honestly, what Sujit is going to be talking about in there. Um, immune stimulating or immune modulating for astragalus, uh, for Mason. Yes. Um, you know, what does that even really mean, immune modulating versus immune stimulating? I think that that's another term that's kind of popped out of the whole herbal medic, medical herbalism thing uh, that is just like, uh, it's just a term that helps people feel superior to other people. <laughs> I'm sorry, but man, that's the way I see it. It's like danger explaining, you know, it's just, um, it's... Uh, well, is this an immune modulator or an immune stimulator if you don't know? You know, it's like, and then and then you get the whole uh, borrowing from TCM saying that it um, closes down the Wei Qi. You know, in other words, it, it helps block off um, pathogens. So from TCM perspective, pathogens were not microbial. They were, they were elemental. They were wind or cold or heat or summer heat or whatever. And so astragalus would help the body by shutting, by kind of being an armor over the weight here, what they would consider kind of their version of our immune system, at least our, um, our, uh, uh, you know, innate immune system, not adaptive. And so um, then the whole thing came up, well, if you use astragalus, you know, from West, this is from Western people, right, that are like, you know, white people like me that know a little bit, uh, you know, that learned a little bit, and they'd say, well, if you use astragalus, it's going to like block off and it'll it'll trap the pathogen in there. And, if, and the truth of the matter is that even in TCM, even though that is a possibility, it's not used though. If you formulate it, that's not the case at all. So, you know, anyway, that was a long-winded and a bit of a tangent. I'm sorry, Mason, but um, uh, is this triglyceride immune modulator immune stimulator? I would say, you know, a modulator is a safer word there because it could go a number of different ways versus just stimulating. But the thing that's interesting about astragalus, for me, from a Western perspective, it is one of the herbs that I think supports, and I'm not going to say modulates, but supports the adaptive immune system versus the innate immune system. So if you don't know, the innate immune system is a part of the immune system that we share with all of the vertebrates. It's, it, it recognizes self from non-self. You cut yourself boom, you're in, you know, your macrophages, your neutrophils are like, you know, this, this is the innate immune system. Well, there's a link, of course, a strong link between the innate and the adaptive because they have to communicate. So at some point or another, the adaptive, which is our memory cells that say, yeah, we've seen this before. We've got antibodies for this anti antigen, right? An antigen means an antibody generator. So this antigen is saying, yeah, blah, blah, blah to our immune system. And we and our immune system says, hey, guess what? We've seen this before. Boom, here comes some antibodies. Well, um, there's not a lot of herbs that are proven, and that's a very loose term, but but that are that are shown to really support the adaptive immune system. But astragalus is one of those that is. And I think I think Stephen Buhner and some of the research he did for that, to pull it out and say, hey, for Lyme disease. You know, they they did a re they did this thing. I can't remember it now, but it was a really interesting experiment, if I remember correctly, where they put uh, you know lime carrying ticks onto rats, and then they, um, then they increased, then they used astragalus or some of the constituents in astragalus to to um, in the bloodstream, like intravenously, and they found that the ticks were not able to infect the rats, and they eventually the Lyme disease, you know, that's in the brain of the tick basically says, okay, unhook from this host. We can't do anything about this. And there are some different reasons about that based on the antibodies that it was that it was stimulated. And I can't remember specifics on that, but it's really interesting. And I think it's in his Lyme disease book, maybe in his reference, he's got the references to that particular experiment. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And it's interesting to have a herb that does definitely support the adaptive immune system. So that's something to think about too. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, this is a lot of fun, um, and we do need to wrap up. And we got about another, you know, five or six minutes here. Um, Stephanie asks this question here. We have thought about this one a lot, Stephanie, because um, yeah, we thought about doing like a lifetime pass thing. Um, I should bring that back up. We have a much bigger and much an incredibly competent admin team now, so this is a question we could bring back up. We haven't talked about it since San Antonio. Um, when we had questions like that. So if we do, and it comes up as a question. So one thing to note is we have an app. 
that's coming out real soon. It's called Herbal Medics. And it's been in the making for about two or three years. It's going to have a ton of stuff in there. It's got a huge inventory of Medica. It's got podcasts that you can't find anywhere else that I'm doing. It's got like a whole, um, it's actually got what do you call it, like a graphic novel done, a, a version of like the adventures of herbal medics. It's got, uh, you know, this is where you'll get like special offers and things that you wouldn't get otherwise. So that should be coming out in the next month or two. I hope it's been due to come out for a long time and we're still coming up with a little bit of stuff, a little bit of uh, material for it. But anyway. Um, Samsung asks, what are the, the name of the book? Um, Stephen Buhner's Lyme book. He's got a couple, I think an earlier one and a later one. So whichever his latest Lyme disease book is for Stephen Buhner, I'll write his name. He passed as well uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately. But look up Stephen Buhner and Lyme disease and you'll see it. And I'm pretty sure in there he's got, he's got a lot of different references to it. Awesome. Thank you, Chiafone. Yes. Um, Okay, did I get everything there? Technically, there's more, but it'll never end, Sam, and I want to be respectful of your time, so. <laughs> um, absolutely, yeah. I probably would call it on that for the Q&A specifically. Um, I can run through here if there's one. I feel like I kind of gave the the um, short end of the stick to the um, the YouTube questions, although those um, handouts that I that I gave you to put up there, Mason, will cover a lot of the YouTube questions for sure. That's uh, great. Yeah. And you know what? That's why you show up live to these things. So I just got to say thanks to everyone for actually attending. That was awesome. The, the interaction on the chat was amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's um, that's where it all comes to a head is this is, is, um, being able to talk face to face, right? Or as close and, to and I threw in a selfish question about the astragalus because someone re recently reached out to me and they said our monograph was all wrong because we said this versus this. And uh, like I said, that was just music to my ears, your explanation. So I really appreciated you answering that as well. Yeah, there are so many people <laughs> that make themselves self-important off of little pieces. <laughs> and that's the problem with not with herbalism. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'd close with that thought. It's like, there's not a standardized you know, evaluation. If it were up to me, I would... I would not pre prevent for people from practicing herbalism as clinicians if they weren't licensed, but I would create a licensing process in there mm. that included at least two or three years of basic science in Western side. It would include like maybe a year kind of uh, introduction into you know, TCM concepts. It would include like a really big materia medica and understanding how to work with that before you could even, before anything else. So that people, so there was a standardized process. And so people weren't all, you know, weren't using, I mean, I've had, you know, because of the work we've done with herbal medics, I've been in places where, um, like we, we did a six months of support at Standing Rock at, a, at not at the main camp, but at, um, whatever it's sacred stone, I think it was called a camp. And we stepped on the toes of somebody else who didn't know what the hell they were doing that would just, you know, come up and say, well, I'm an intuitive herbalist and you're really insulting me. And it's like, and they didn't know this same person didn't know that there were botanical names for plants. They got upset because one of our students was trying to help them by alphabetizing. And they yeah. wanted to know why the hell Yara was over here in the A's. And she's, well, this is, <laughs> you know, because we do everything by, by genus, you know, alphabetize is how we always run our clinics. So, you know, it's Achillea. And she's screaming, you know, and then and then my student, I walked over my students saying, well, it's the genus. We, I'm sorry, but we do it botanical names. And she, and it was just like this blank look in her eyes. She said, the what? The genus. <laughs> it's just so, that's the kind of stuff that people need to know, right? And I think in order to be able to, number one, because um, herbalism needs that in the West, but number two, and more importantly, because if you want to actually be taken seriously by Western medicine, you have to be able to be a translator and you have mm -hmm. to show that you have competency in things like pathophysiology and basic science, or you'll never, they're never going to listen to you. They're going to laugh at anything you say. And that's been my strength is I've been able to do that. And I have... I work with a lot of docs and a lot of NPs, and I've done some pretty crazy and amazing things. Not me, but the herbs have done turned around C diff like like a week before an operation. I've done that more than once, and you know, docs going, I don't know what the hell you're doing, but keep doing it. You know, so I that's the kind of stuff that I'm into, and I think that that's that's what we need in herbalism to be able to give ourselves significance 
as a as a practice. We need that. And because we need herbs, we need herbalism in this country really badly. And our medical system is a joke. We've got to do something about that. And so you've got to be taken seriously by the powers that be, love them or hate them. You got to be taken seriously by them. Great way to wrap up. So again, Sam Coppin, you find him at herbalmedics.academy and the humanpath.net. Check out his book. All these links will be in the show notes, et cetera. But um, yes, that, that's the Herbal Medic, the book. I, I just got to say thanks again, Sam, for going over hour and a half. That was awesome. Thanks to you all for hanging out with us and uh, all of the amazing questions. And uh, like you said, you didn't get to some of the YouTube questions, but that's okay. You got to some of them and that's that's the benefit of showing up live. So we really appreciate you showing up live. And um, for all those out there, this will be uh, live on, um, well, this will be released on YouTube as well as the podcast sometime in the next week or so. So any closing thoughts, anything else you want to plug or promote, Sam? No, just thanks to everybody for being here. I uh, really appreciate you. Um, appreciate my students that were here too. I, uh, that was cool. That was really cool. You could tell the the some of your students came when you set up that link because I could tell by the sh by the chat. So that was rad. So I'm glad you shared that. So, uh, yeah, I guess thanks again, and um, everybody have a good night. We'll see you later. All right. Be careful, Sam. Thank you.